Good morning. Welcome back to Leadership Cafe. Our fourth of the year, and um, this morning we're going to do transformational leadership. And as opposed to leadership cafes in the past, this one will build a little bit on what we did last month as far as charismatic leadership. Uh, we'll do some uh, a little bit of a refresher if you weren't here with us. Uh, the videos for each of these cafes. Uh, are online. Uh, the one that we did now three weeks ago will be up here probably in the next week or two, and then this one will be up <coughs> a week or two after that. So if you ever want to catch up, if you ever want to um, try to remember a slide that I used or something like that, the slides are incorporated into the video. Uh, so you can always go to uh, ubahouston.org slash leadership cafe, and everything is there. Uh, we will be, this has gotten a pretty good response as far as registrations and, and interest, and so it looks like we will start um, doing a new semester, a new round of these in the spring, uh, and so I'll be announcing topics of that uh, coming up. We, we have mentioned in the past doing um, leadership as defined by different cultures, uh, and so looking at cross-cultural leadership, and so we'll probably touch on, on that topic. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, leadership theories out there that we haven't mentioned, a couple of my personal favorites we haven't hit yet, and um, probably the best leadership book that I could ever give out um, has yet to show up on any of your bibliographies, but it's called Reframing Organizations. It's by Bowman and Beal. It's got to be in its fifth edition probably by now. Uh, Reframing Organizations, that book alone will probably be the subject of one of these leadership cafes. Um, <clears throat> when you look for it on Amazon, you can buy uh, one version back, one edition back for next to nothing. I think I got my uh, third edition for $2. Um, and so you won't miss a whole lot if you buy a slightly older edition. Uh, but anyway, that's a little shout out. We'll be covering that book. I would hand it out to people, except when they see it, it's, it's like 400 pages long. Now. Okay, I, the jokes write themselves when a guy with a PhD says, but it's a really easy read. This one really is an easy read. Okay, it's 400 pages, it's beefy. Um, you probably heard somebody with it if you wanted to, it's thick. But, um, it, but hands down, it's the best leadership book out there. Um, it is not uh, what we have talked about before as far as being axiomatic, which means uh, if it was a list book at 400 pages, that would be just insane. Um, but they look at organizations from a variety of perspectives, and so we will dive into that uh, in the springtime, and it, it will definitely be worth your time. It's a, it's a very good book. What's the title again? Reframing Organizations. It's, that's the main title. It's got a subtitle, but Reframing Organizations. Bowman, B-O-L-M-A-N, is one of the authors, and Deal, D-E-A-L, is the other one. Bowman and Deal. Uh, and they will borrow some concepts in that book that we're going to talk about today as far as transformational leadership. Now, again, just as a reminder for some of you who are um, with us for the first time, uh, Leadership Cafe is not uh, designed to be, here are five things to take back to your leadership context, and they all start with the same letter, uh, write them down, do them, and everybody will be happy. That's not what this is geared for. Um, there are a lot of other things, podcasts, conferences, everything else out there is geared for that. This is geared to be a place where we take a concept, a leadership concept, and we chew it up, and we dialogue about it, and we ask questions, we poke holes in it if necessary, or we walk out of here going, man, that's a really good line of thinking. Uh, so, as opposed to other leadership conferences, which are geared to just be um, a place where you digest, this is a place where I hope you will think critically. Um, ask the hard questions. Uh, we've gotten pushback before in leadership cafes that, well, it wasn't church-oriented enough, or oh, there were too many business references. To me, leadership, uh, there are some core principles of leadership that can be exercised in any leadership context, but the real fun of leadership is saying, well, now, I minister in a hospital, I minister in a business, I minister in a church, I do all these different things. What does leadership look like differently? Oh, that works in my context. It doesn't work at all in my context. Um, so that's the fun of talking about leadership. So, so think critically about this and 
Um, look specifically for ways to build your own capacity. Look for something that is unique to you, unique to the people that you lead, unique to your context, and take it home with you. Um, they, we're going to cover a lot of ground. These are designed to cover a lot of ground. And so uh, the goal of this is not for you to be an expert on transformational leadership when you walk out. The goal is for you to build your own capacity. So keep that in mind uh, as we go through. Now, today, just as a, a brief refresher on, on how we are going to get to um, transformational leadership, leadership has been studied for eons and eons. But it wasn't until uh, about the 40s that somebody said, maybe leadership isn't just getting people to do what I want them to do. Um, whether that's, and usually it's in a political context or a military context. Um, educational context came along after that, but for the most part it was, how do I get a crowd to do what I want them to do? Um, with the best of intentions, or maybe not with the best of intentions. Um, and in the 40s, there started to be a distinction among people who were thinking critically about leadership between persuasion and coercion. Okay, how do I persuade somebody to do something is different than how do I make them do it. In fact, even in the 40s, leadership was sometimes called drivership. <laughs> Which we look at now and we think, man, that's antiquated and and dictatorial and all these other things, but at the time, it was the idea of how do I drive people toward a goal? How do I drive people toward accomplishment? How do I really get them moving? And so leadership by coercion was distinguished from persuasion. And, they, and scholars and thinkers about leadership took that into the 50s and they started saying, well, certain groups behave differently than other groups. And leading a small group is different than leading a big group. And leading a, a, a fire team in a military context is different than leading an entire brigade. And so how do I really distinguish group leadership? And then in the 60s came along this whole you know, batch of studies saying, maybe it's not just that certain people are inherently good at leadership, which is trait theory. We talked about that two cafes ago. Maybe there is a set of behaviors that people can exhibit that are akin to good leaders. So maybe certain leaders, good leaders, behave in ways that are different than either normal people, whatever normal is, or bad leaders, which we can usually identify mostly in hindsight. So what are the leadership behaviors? And then uh, the 70s, they continue to chew on that. And in the 80s, a bunch of stuff really got going as far as leadership theory. And a lot of serious, serious thinkers and some of the classics in, uh, in the Barnes & Noble section of leadership got written in the 80s. Um, because you have a couple of people that come along and they say, we're going to look at organizations and what it means to be an effective organization. And by doing that, sometimes they looked at the metrics of an organization, but most of the time, those kind of studies went back to, well, what does the CEO do to make that organization effective? And it wasn't long and it wasn't hard to cross the thin line there before they started looking at those CEOs of effective organizations and saying, well, they have these traits, okay? Which means inherently they are better leaders than other people and that's why there are better organizations than other organizations. So uh, they started flirting with trait theory again. They also um, wanted to look at the difference between management and leadership. Uh, especially in organizations. I mean, Taylor had been written about industrialization and organization for a long time, but especially in the 80s, um, you know, the cubicle farms really were up and going at this point, and so everybody wanted to know, what is it about leaders that are different than managers, or is there anything different? Is it all the same? Um, and kind of moving away from getting people to do what we want them to do, the buzzword in the 80s was influence. Uh, that's where this concept of leadership as influence really got up and going. Um, it's, it's we want people to do certain things, we believe in certain things that are good for either the church, the organization, the government, the military, whatever it is, but how do we influence people to adopt those things so that they will more freely do them and everybody can benefit? Does that make sense? In the church context, this um, really starts to take shape probably about 10 years after that, and you see a lot, of, uh, a lot of leadership things being applied in the 90s as far as leadership as influence, and this is what it means to be a believer, and these are the goals that you should be shooting for, and this is how you are going to 
disciple and develop other people around you. And, and so all of that thinking starts happening in the 90s. But as we, as we kind of look at the history there, um, let's dive into this concept of management versus leadership. Now, one of the books that I put on your bibliography is a classic by uh, Warren and Bennis. Now, they uh, are Warren Bennis and Burton Annis. Bennis and Annis. They originally wrote that book in 1985. It was, it was refreshed again in 2007. Um, very good, and actually it's sitting out on the table as you came in here, and its most distinguishing feature from the other four that I have out there is it's tiny, okay? The paperback version of it is like this thick. Um, you could read it in an afternoon. If you really, really wanted to rifle through it, it it's a very easy read. But um, Bennis and Nannis have done a lot of really good thinking on leadership, and they've been doing this for decades. Um, but this is where kind of the quote comes from, managers do things right while leaders do the right things. So as you're thinking about the difference between management and leadership, this is an interactive uh, exercise here, what are the differences? How do you define management apart from leadership? And you can, you can say, well, managers do certain things and leaders do other certain things, but what are you thinking? What's the difference between managers and leaders? Managers are tasked with the task. Tasked with the task. I like that quote. That's good. I'm going to totally steal that from you. All right. <laughs> You're tasked with the task. Yeah, absolutely. As opposed to leaders who are tasked with what? The vision. Okay. Okay. We have a pretty sharp distinction between vision and task. All right. What else? Is that it? Well, I think you're probably on that concept that says managers are charged with executing on a defined set of tasks or a defined set of duties that's been given to them. And they've got some extra, some room to exercise how those get executed, but they've already gotten their, their defined duties. And leaders are those that are out defining what those duties are or um, determining what things ha uh, need to happen. That makes sense. Maybe, sure, absolutely. Maybe a manager would be more concerned with the principle rather than the right thing. For instance, uh, Jesus told him, you know, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, but if you have a donkey that fell in the hole or if somebody's hungry, you're not going to do anything for them because supposedly you're working. See, the principle is more important than... Oh, okay. I see. see what I'm saying? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So maybe managers are more concerned with doing the right thing getting them done the way it's supposed to be done, but every once in a while, we need to do what's even higher than that, if I can put it in that terminology. Yeah, absolutely, I, and, and kind of hits on some similar concepts here. I mean, historically even, managers were charged with making sure that the machine works and that the machine gets what it's supposed to get, right? And so managers typically and traditionally have been um, the ones that put out the fires because the machine is not getting what it's supposed to get. Um, now, if so when you think of a manager and you think of a leader, um, do you think of them the same way? Do you think of them both positively? <laughs> no. I do. You do, okay? Well, let's flesh that out because, again, most of the time when I ask a question, I can play both sides just in case I have to. So, uh, why? Why do you, why? Well, you need both. You need both. Okay. Managers get it okay. done. Managers get it done. All right. All right. Now, those of you that said no, I don't think of them the same way. I mean, not the same way. A positive. That's what I. You're, you're applying value to both. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm. That's what the question was. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. In a positive way. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody? Uh, I think ahead. of uh, managers more in um, a maintenance role right. rather than a growth. Well, you know, sure. if you want to grow, you, it takes leadership to maintain you to be a good manager. So yeah. Not that there's a negative in the management, but you want to grow. I, that's just the way I think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think performance is a factor as well, because if you have, you have an organization that has several managers, each of those management sections, some perform better than others, but if you have the leader, who doesn't perform, 
uh, it's very, very quickly black and white whether they're they're going to get by, whether you, how well the organization is going to do. That's interesting because it, initially, even as you were speaking, I was thinking there's a vast difference between the scorecards, right? How a manager is graded versus how a leader is graded. But before you said that, I would have said leaders have a more vague scorecard, so it's actually harder to see when they're doing it right. Because you can have a, like we talked about last month, you can have a really charismatic leader. He's like, that's the hill we're gonna take. This is why we're doing it. Here are our core values. Here are some strategies. You know, let's all do this and, and you know, and go take that hill. And you may, it may be five years before you realize, you know, they, they never took the hill. In fact, they didn't even trip forward on the direction to the hill. He's just talking about a hill. Um, and so, but a manager, you're like, a manager's like, did we take a step today? No? Yes? Okay, good. Check that box, you know? And then tomorrow we need another step. And so managers, if, if they are gonna be as task oriented as we're kind of giving them, uh, I would think the trigger would be quicker on a manager than on a leader. But I, but I see what you're saying too. I think in the big scope of things, you can look at an organization and go, you know, wow, that, that didn't work well. That must be the leader. Or, you know, in, in the business world, right, you look at a stock price and go, what did the stock price do last year? Now let's talk to the leader about that, which is a very concrete scorecard, but usually applied to a more vague kind of leadership role. Um, can you be both? Can you be a manager and a leader? So for me, that gets to your definition of what a manager is or what a leader is. So, you know, what the context you're looking at, like for me, in most of the illustrations that I'm thinking off the top of my head, someone who's classified as a manager, administrator, an implementer, if they're over people, they still have to be a leader. They still have to motivate. They still have to inspire. They have to, they have to say vision, there are skills and sets that they need. And so for me, I think sometimes we've drawn a really clear line and said this guy manages and this guy leads. And, and for me, if, if you have a person in leadership who doesn't understand how to administrate and manage and has certain skills, eventually they're going to break down. And if you have a manager that doesn't have leadership ability to envision and take ownership of their area. So to me, uh, I don't draw a hard distinction between the two. It's just what is your particular role and, and how do those, they're going to be balanced, but management and leadership for me has to take place wherever there's people that, that are being, we're trying to get from here to there. That, that's for me sure. personally. Yeah, well, no, I, and I think there's a lot of research out there that supports what you're saying. And also, a lot of people who, without thinking too deeply into it, say, well, um, in fact, I, I'll read you something I got off of a list. Um, when I was doing research, this is a scholarly article, and they said, um, a leader focuses on people and a manager focuses on things. Well, okay, but if you're a manager and you manage people and your orientation is things, there's at least a reasonable chance that you're not going to be a good manager, mm -hmm. right? Because people are people. Um, so now if you're, a, if you're a manager of a data processing you know, thing and you spend most of your time punching numbers, okay, well, you're probably not managing a whole lot of people. You're probably not giving a whole lot of thought to the leadership. You're just totally task oriented in that. But a manager is a manager of people. And so uh, it was interesting, in the 80s and 90s, people started having knockdown drag outs about, well, that's a leader and that's a manager. And you know, well, we kind of need both, but we really need leaders. And you can teach people how to manage because that's a set of behaviors. And it's, you know, get, make sure that the machine works. But leaders is this whole other thing. And as is typical in any area of research, the pendulum swung way out and then came all the way back. And now we're kind of in an environment where um, not only do people not focus as much on the distinction between leadership and management, but they're more free to have conversations just like what Jeff said. You've got to be able to do both to a certain extent. Now, are there roles that are going to live at 30,000 feet as opposed to three feet? Absolutely. Absolutely, and in certain industries, you're going to have more often than in other industries. Um, and in the church world, I think in particular, this line gets blurred really, really fast. Um, because the machine is people-oriented, right? The product is people, right? It's changed lives. Um, which means the input to the machine is people. 
And so if you have uh, leaders in a church environment that are really good in front of a faceless crowd, they have a very limited skill set and ability to influence the crowd until they start seeing the faces. Um, now that being said, are there certainly leaders in those contexts and in others that are so task oriented that they can't zoom out, that they can't fly up to 30,000 feet? I would say yes. Um, and so you see churches, um, in fact, I, I listened to a podcast this week where they did a succession plan and the founding pastor became the teaching pastor and the new senior pastor rarely preaches, like maybe once a month. He casts some vision and stuff, but, but they said, and the teaching pastor is the guy with the voice and I'm really good at running the machine. And that's how they ran their succession process, which I thought was really interesting. Um, but, so yeah, you have all of this kind of going on, um, this distinction, this discussion about management and leadership. So what is leadership on the ground level? Like, what does it actually look like? The first people who started, remember I, I said in every leadership cafe, leadership theory is usually boxes and arrows. We're going to have some boxes and arrows today, okay? We will also have lists. So we will have all three of the vital components, boxes, arrows, and lists. Uh, that's right, yeah. So cheer for that. If, if you are a, you know, a, a particular geek like I am, then yes, boxes, arrows, and lists. So um, the first box that normally gets thrown up when we talk about what leadership is it revolves around a couple of, of um, components here. One is contingent reward and one is management by exception. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Contingent reward is a fancy way of saying, you do this and I will pay you, okay? It is a standard agreement between a boss and an employee or between an organization and an employee to say, we are hiring you to do certain things, okay? Not complicated. The other part of, of kind of how leadership really gets fleshed out on the ground level is management by exception. Now, what I mean by that is if you are an active manager by exception, you are focused on the machine, right? You are focused on whether or not it's, it's producing what it's supposed to produce. You are hovering over the machine so that the slightest glimpse of it coming off the rails, you're there to correct it, okay? I had a brother who worked in a call center and this environment of management by exception was alive and well in the call center because the manager would just hover through the aisles and he would listen for what people are doing and are they reading the script and oh you shouldn't have said that to the customer and there was all and he said it was an impressive environment to work in because he was just constantly living under the am i going to get smacked at any second now because i said this or because i had a bad call or i had a belligerent customer whatever it was um, and so that is active, kind of corrective criticism kind of thing, all right? Uh, now, this isn't a pat on the back, hey, let's try to do better next time, you know, let's, you know, well, I will go get the next one. That's not that, okay? This is a, ah, don't do that again. You know, ah, you should have done that. That kind of environment. That's management by exception. When it's active. When it's passive, that is an employee goes six months and then gets a performance review, and they get crushed on the performance review, and they had no idea that it was going badly. Okay? So that's, that is someone who is managing and tad passive aggressive, probably, you know, or maybe anti conflict, and they're like, well, I gotta write this down, and they're, we really are a terrible employee. I just don't wanna deal with that on a daily basis, so I'm just gonna destroy them in their annual review. Okay? And so, now, immediately, like my temptation is to say, okay, the people that are laughing, you know what this looks like. And so I really badly want to hear that story, but I'm going to cruise past that. Uh, so, but for those of you who have seen the, 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 um, uh, the movie that I can't fully endorse, Office Space, um, you have seen Management by Exception, okay? That the actor portrayed in this picture, you know, hovers around the cubicles. I, I love it because he's even got the, the coffee mug in one hand and leans over the cubicle on the other. He says, okay, when he's telling his employees to do things. Um, has no concern for the employees as people at all. He's like, hey, you didn't put a cover sheet on that report, you know? So um, if, you, if you YouTube Office Space later, you'll get this picture a thousand times. It's usually a three minute clip. Uh, and there are usually no curse words in that clip, watch it, and that will be management by exception. 
<laughs> but, uh, so, you know, so there's my semi-lukewarm endorsement. Uh, now, the, the question, though, is, is that leadership? Is that leadership? This whole contingent reward, okay, which is, again, a legitimate contract between employers and employees, is that leadership? It's intimidation. It's defiled leadership. Well, now, okay, now, let, okay, let's, let's distinguish what we're talking about. The management by exception is really fun to poke holes in and really fun to mess with. Let's talk about contingent reward. Contingent reward is that leadership. If I sign up to work for an organization, let's say I really like the leader, you know, I, I was recruited for a purpose, and he says, you know, or she says, hey, go and do this job, and we will pay you this, we will provide benefits, or we won't, whatever it is, but here's the, the, the contract agreement. Is that leadership? To me, that's a structure. No. Okay, to you, that's a structure. Now, so it's not leadership. <laughs> uh, to me, if, if, someone, if someone is uh, just functioning on their own, they're fulfilling their, their contract or they're not, and so that would be administrative, that would be, did you accomplish this or not? So I'm not developing you, I'm not growing you, I'm not, so to me, it, it has some uh, administrative tasks, it has some of those, manage, it's actually management tasks, but it's really not growing a person, developing a person, which to me are part of leadership. So I, I would say it's task, and and there is leadership required to accomplish some tasks, but I wouldn't, it, it wouldn't fit my definition. See, and you know, any time between, uh, before the 1960s, what you just said wouldn't have made sense. Because what you, you said was, well, they're doing the job, but they're not growing and developing. They would have stopped you and said, whoa, whoa. You had me at there doing their job. Right, you know, like, right, right. I don't know that whole growth and development thing. We have like a retreat for that every five years, but you know, we're not going there. But since then, this discussion has really taken on a new flavor, right? So, okay, talk to me more. And you said no. No, because it's a, if, it's, if it's a defined contract for a specified outcome, then that's, that sets the expectation. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, once you, if somebody exceeds the expectation, then they then the organization go, whoa, we might have a leader here, or you know that. But right off the bat, that's not that's not leadership. It's a defined outcome that all you have to do is check off the list. And it's interesting. I'm going to come back to you in just a second. It's interesting too that what you just defined even was an excellent employee. You know, mm -hmm. like a, a salesperson who hits their goals and exceeds their goals every quarter is an excellent employee. And so at that point, in a contingent reward type environment, what do you do for those excellent employees? Bonus. Do what? Bonus. Yeah. Yeah, you load them up with a bonus or a reward of some sort. And so it's kind of the idea of now at the base level, a contingent reward is, you know, we pay you to work 40 hours a week. So make sure that you don't clock out at 39 hours and 30 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, and if you clock out at 40 hours and 30 minutes, then whoa, wait. You might have somebody that shows some initiative here. But somebody that continues to hit their goals, why are they hitting their goals? Why are they exceeding their goals in a contingent reward environment? Because they want the bonus, right? They want more reward, okay? Um, yeah, what were you gonna say? I was, uh, I've heard a management discussion and the, uh, the quote within that group was, the rules are for your good employees. <laughs> okay, flesh that out. The rules, and for the rules good are, good, are, are for your good employees, those who come in at, on time, clock out on time, don't, you know, take their, their breaks on time, uh, meet all the requirements, check all the boxes, that's who the rules are for. But if, but if anybody's exceptional, then, then you, you recognize them. Yeah, you load them up with those rewards, right? And what now? Again, this is this is real concrete level stuff. By recognizing the excellent employees, why does that benefit the organization? Keeps them performing. Well, yeah, and it, but it goes one step further, and this is where the discussion of is it leadership or not comes into play. 
if you give bonuses to a really good employee, you keep them. You grow the. Well, you keep them, but aren't you also trying to motivate the other ones? Mm -hmm. Say, hey, they hit their bonus, and look at what they got. You know, or you know, they they hit their performance. They get an extra week of vacation. And everybody else is sitting there going, man, I really want an extra week of vacation. And so now next month I'm going to try and hit my goals. Now is that leadership? So in this culture, where you have people who no longer have the value that I want to work more than 40 hours, I have other values. To me, there's some examples where this person's getting rewarded. It's appealing to them, and this person says, "I want more time off. I, I don't want more money. I don't want more responsibility. I don't." So, to me, that's not. Again, it. I think we have the locus is now in the individual more than it used to be, and there's some influences there. That's so. So to me, that I mean, I've been in organizations where this person said, "Man, that's great. Give give them another raise. Give them more work. Give them. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because I value family. They, you know, I don't want to be here more than 40 hours. Yeah. So yeah. there's some other factors that I think that used to not be there. Like you said before the 50s, whatever they wouldn't even talk about developing the person. And today, that might motivate A, but it won't motivate B. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and and that's really, that's really it. So you have people that and thinkers who have existed in this kind of environment for so long, and they keep running up against that. They keep running up against well. We offer to pay them more, we get bonuses, and they're still not doing it. And we, now we're going to try and load them up with vacation time. They don't want that either. They don't want the gold watch, and they don't want the certificate, and they don't want the whatever it is. Um, you know, they don't want the, all those contingent rewards. How do we motivate those people? And, and you have very, in some cases, very well-intentioned employees going, you can't. You can't motivate. Like, there's nothing. This, I'm going to clock in and clock out, and I'm done. My very first, and I will go toe to toe with with anybody on bad jobs. Okay, my first job, I can't make this up. My first job was working as a grounds maintenance technician in a cemetery. <laughs> That's right, grounds maintenance technician. Okay, I worked a trimmer in a cemetery and occasionally had to jump in very deep holes. Okay, so. Uh, Hey, but at least you never made anybody mad. That is actually not true. That is because that be I can tell you that the little plastic flowers that are around certain headstones, you hit that with a trimmer, and you have a bouquet flying in a thousand different directions. Now, the good people that built and designed those plastic flowers knew that they're going to hand a trimmer to a 16-year-old and he's probably not going to be paying attention. And so you can reassemble those flowers very well. Uh, unless the family happens to be standing there and then you make them angry. So I'm just saying I've heard from a friend that that's how that happens. <laughs> uh, so, you know, but that job, I mean, I was around non-potable water all day, okay? And trimming around headstones, let's just say I wasn't looking for opportunities to work 45 hours a week, okay? <laughs> like, I need exactly this. I'm gonna put, I mean, I was the guy and was everybody else on my crew that watched the clock go bink, you know, and that's when we punched our time card, you know? We were always there strategically a couple minutes early, just in case, I don't know, the earth shifted and it was gonna go bink a little earlier. But, you know, that was one of those things that they could have said, hey, we will double your pay. And I'm like, I am still out here in the summer, in a cemetery, and being showered with non potable water occasionally. Thanks, but keep your money, you know? Like, I don't need it that bad. So you get into certain environments. Now, that's obviously a worst case scenario, and I tell that mostly just to make fun of my first job. But you get into other environments where organizations are coming at it, not just because they need more widgets. You know, or they need something, but because honestly, they're looking at people saying, okay, how do we get people to buy into the vision? How do we get people to see that what they're doing is really important? Now, think of a company recently, if you, if you can think of one, think of a company that has convinced every level of their organization that what they do is important. Can you think of one? Yes. What? I got an example. Bring it. My my son is in his first year of leadership development with Chick-fil-A. Okay. 
uh, he's been with the company for five years and started out as dumping the trash and cleaning the toilets and you know ground right. up. Uh, I was talking to him last night and he is currently in the process this is I wrote it down uh, this is actually a training segment for Chick-fil-A leaders real-time truth-telling that builds the bench okay and what they're training their employees to do uh, at all levels is speak the truth you know what that was unacceptable you've done it in the past let's see if you can get it together and do it again you know and they're, they're doing that at every level of the company they're, they're, they're not waiting six months to give them evaluation they're hitting it right here right now and developing people as they go sure uh, and I thought it was fascinating listening to him talk yeah. that's exactly what you're talking about every level of the company yeah and I, you know and so that's from a from a corrective and a development perspective um, are there other examples where you have engaged a company or or an organization or a church or whatever and every employee that you've met you're like wow they they get it there's something a little different going on at this particular company I'll tell you where I've most recently seen I've seen it in a few different companies uh, and I hate to always go to this example, but I'm so thoroughly impressed with Southwest Airlines yeah, that's what I'm because I travel a lot and I occasionally see other airlines and I see the differences and I, I flew, I won't name the carrier, large carrier, just a few days ago and, this, and they were nice people, but you could tell that they were nice and they were in their minds looking for the clock to tick so that they could punch out and you could also tell that if you happen to be speaking to them when the clock ticked, you were probably going to lose. <laughs> you know? And they were very nice, and I'm sure they would have brushed you off in the very nicest way possible, but you could, you could just tell. You know? And you could also tell by looking at how people were relating to them. You know, they were like, you know, people in line were automatically more aggressive because they thought, I better get this person while they're feeling good and paying attention or whatever because I don't really know what I'm going to get otherwise. And I, I contrast that with Southwest employees, and I've known guys at Southwest who sling bags. I know guys who work the counter. Um, you know, one of the most impressive employees that I talked to at Southwest Airlines was a few weeks ago, a woman who was standing there, and she was the one saying, get in the, this line, get in this line, which for me, would be just mind-numbing, you know, just, you know, I'm here to herd the cows this way and this way. That's how I, I'm not a good boy. I guess that's how I would approach that. And you could tell that her mentality was, not only am I gonna own this responsibility, but I'm the first touch that our company has with these customers, and they're going to at least, as they're stressed out and pulling their bags and doing all this, and where do I gotta go, and I'm late, and you know, all this stuff, I'm going to own this moment and I'm going to make it better for them. Because I had to ask a non-standard question. Like I wasn't just a cow coming to get in the line. I actually didn't have to get in the line. I just needed to talk to somebody. And I was like, I can't just walk up to the front of the line. People you know, get hurt that way. So I'm not doing that. Um, I can't just grab a pilot because they're probably not going to know. And so what, you know, what do I do? And so I walked to this person who was greeting and I said, i, I got to ask a question. And she owned the question. She said, this is what you got to do. And when you get to the front of the line, this is what you say. And it was, it was awesome. It was awesome. And, and this is in an environment where most people are trying to avoid people, right? You have the automatic kiosks. Those are there to reduce human contact. And by the way, that's not just like a faceless company saying we would rather not talk to people. That's also customers saying we would rather not talk to people, you know? So. It was, it was just a great moment. So at, at the bottom level of organizations, right, the guys that are slinging back or the guys that are taking out the trash, how do you get them to own company values? How do you get them to buy into a process of exceeding expectations? And so people take those questions and they say, okay, there's got to be more to leadership. You know, there's some core management stuff that's got to be done and some leadership that is done at the management level but there has to be more. And so in the late 70s, several people started thinking about what is it to be a, a transforming, which is what it was originally called, a transforming leader. Um, 
what does transformation really look like? How do we get people to transcend their own self-interest, right? How do we get people to show up for work looking for more than a paycheck or a reward? And so, um, so a couple of guys started uh, thinking, and uh, one of them was James McGregor Burns, and what they were looking for is the difference between leadership and someone who exercised power. Uh, power wielders and, and is, is someone who will marshal influence, right, and marshal people and marshal resources to activate some goals without necessarily worrying about the followers' values and goals themselves. A leader, according to kind of late 70s, early 80s, some of these thinkers is someone who, and this is a, a definition here, mobilizing in competition or conflict with others, resources to arouse, engage, and satisfy the motives of followers. And so a guy named James McGregor Burns writes a book called Leadership. It's out on the table if you'd like to see it. It's very thick, very small type, not such an easy read. He was a political thinker and involved in, in some administration work at the presidential level. Um, and he started looking at really good political leaders and what was it that made them transformational in, in his talk or transforming. And he said this, leadership is a process of leaders inducing followers to act for certain goals that represent the values and motivations, the wants and needs, the aspirations and expectations of both leaders and followers. And so there are a couple of things that you gotta hone in on in this definition. The first is the fact that we're talking about both leaders and followers, and what both of those groups want. Because up until this point, what a follower wanted was considered to be what? Irrelevant. Well, irrelevant or that contingent reward, right? We need to get people who will either work for the absolute minimum that I want to pay them, or if it's, if it's a role that we really want to put some energy in, we will recruit people and pull them in based on we're going to throw this pile of money at you, okay? Or we're going to throw this level of influence at you, whatever it was, right? There's a carrot stick agreement. So Burns comes along and says, okay, now we're going to talk about the values and the wants and the needs of both what the leader needs and what the follower needs. And leadership is the process of achieving goals within that context, okay? So it's easy to, and I think some of the other leadership theories that we've talked about, it's easy to lose sight of the goal accomplishment aspect of this, okay? And just focus on, well, what people want. You know, let's develop people. But if you do that, you're, you may develop a lot of people, but it may be hard to assign metrics to that. Right? Churches and nonprofits fall into this hole all the time. Because they're like, look at all the great work that we're doing. And a consultant like me comes along and says, how do you know? How are you measuring it? And they go, well, let me tell you this story. And as soon as they do that, okay, that is the red flag. It doesn't mean they're not doing great things. But as soon as they resort to a story, it means I can't really show you with metrics. So I'm going to tell you the story. It's going to, it's going to provoke tears. Right? You're going to feel great, you're going to feel warm, you're going to want to give us money, but you know this is the thing. That's the nonprofit side of things. Church side of things is similar, but a little different. Um, now, hardcore managers, right, on the other side, will they ever resort to a story? Probably not. Hardcore managers are going to say, because I have the data, right? I can tell you exactly how many widgets we produced this month as opposed to last month. Or I'm going to show you my stock price. And I'm going to show you how it's up 3%. Or you know it's up five percent against the market. That kind of stuff. You know they're resorting to that. And so Burns comes along and says there has to be more. And so in in developing this, um, a guy named Bass comes along and he's on your bibliography because when you get to be a serious thinker about leadership for a long time, uh, you get to start writing things called handbooks. <laughs> and so the Bass Handbook of Leadership is written by a guy named Bernard Bass, and he came along in the 80s, specifically 1985, and he wrote an article that's on your, your sheet, very short article, as opposed to some of the academic stuff that's out there, and he said, this is what transform transformational leadership looks like, and he assigned four odds, okay? 
Uh, he might have been Baptist, who knows? There are four eyes instead of three, so you know, you're going to have to hold that against him. But, uh, but at least they all start with the same letter. Um, and, and he gets credit because the first one used two eyes. So there you go. Um, he comes along and says, all right, when we look at organizations that are doing really well, whether that's military, religious, political, whatever, there's something about leaders that sets them apart from other leaders and other managers. And what is it? And he said it is these four things. First of all, is idealized influence. Um, idealized influence is the charismatic role of leadership. Uh, it is a person who will stand up and drive the emotions of people. It is somebody who will set themselves as a role model. It is so someone who says, um, we are not going to set little goals. We're going to set big goals. We're going to have major expectations. And, uh, and this is why those expectations are important. Now, theorists came along after that and said, well, idealized influence, charisma is really two things. It's whether people think that person is a leader and whether or not they are a leader or acting like a leader. And so that's the difference between what is attributed leadership and behavioral leadership or charisma. Uh, and so some people say, no, there are five eyes. And then some people came along later and said, well, this whole inspirational motivation sounds a lot like charisma to me. So maybe we're going to collapse this idealized influence and this inspirational motivation into one thing. And of course, then it's not all eyes, but you know, we're going to call that charisma. And so uh, sometimes you will see three eyes, and they'll say inspiration slash charisma just to keep the whole eye thing going. But you see inspirational motivation. And this is someone who, who really focuses on this shared vision and motivating people to buy into that shared vision, okay? which is different than idealized influence. You can have a role model that doesn't have a vision. Does that make sense? You may really like a person. You may really want to emulate a certain person. But you're going to emulate them in the absence of any kind of real goal or really shared vision. It's just you're trying to emulate some characteristics. And so that's why idealized influence is typically seen as different from inspirational motivation. Then you have beyond charisma. And we talked about charismatic leadership last month. This, you know, these first two things are charismatic leadership. They all flesh out differently, and we can talk about that in a second. But, but Bass and Burns and others said there's something beyond just being a rah-rah guy. Even a really good well-intentioned, caring rah-rah guy, there's more. So he would say intellectual stimulation, which is people want to be challenged. People want to think about things and do things better or put their own individualized stamp on things. And remember, in the early 80s, this is revolutionary thinking in a leadership environment. These days, you're like, man, if you don't give people a voice, you won't be a leader very long or you won't hold that employee very long. But at the time this was written, intellectual stimulation was something people going, you mean they want to think about their jobs? They want control on how to do their jobs and how to achieve their goals and all of that? How, how, whoa, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. And there were a lot of managers that were not comfortable with that. Um, this is also the part where you challenge people to better themselves. So remove the organizational component of it for a little bit and just say, there are times where it is for the good of the employee themselves to be challenged. You know, are you really sure that that's how you feel or how you're thinking? And have you thought about it from this perspective? And the word paradigm starts to enter into the literature around this time. And people start messing with mental models, which is, well, I approached work like this. I always saw work as something I went to and did and then left and come home. I didn't really see work as calling or work as responsibility or work as value. And so the way that you get at that is that is through this intellectual stimulation. It's challenging people to think through why they do what they do. And then this last part is individualized consideration. This is the people component of leadership. And not the, of course, the faceless crowd aspect of leadership. This is the, if you want to be a transforming leader, a transformational leader, you have to have impact and relationship with the people that you lead. Um, and so 
you know, this is, there's coaching involved in this, and caring, and advising, and this is, you know, um, you know, and this is one of the things that uh, typically, if you have ministers that are terrible about all other things, they usually do this well, okay? Uh, this is the shepherding aspect of leadership in church context, okay? Now, you may have other guys that are great raw rah guys and terrible shepherds, and that's a whole different thing, but this is the shepherding part, and this is... This is, you know, standard practice in a church environment, right? This comes with a built, this is the built-in expectation. Not always executed, but that's the built-in expectation. In secular environments, this is the part where you're like, wait, what now? I mean, first of all, you're telling me that it's not just about achieving my goals. Now you're telling me I got to provide some reason for them to come to work, and I got to care that they do? And I gotta ask about how their families are doing, and I gotta ask, you know, how they're thinking, and where do they see themselves in five years, and how can I help you get there, and that kind of, you know, this is very touchy feely stuff here, and I got into leadership to avoid touchy feely stuff. So, you know, what are you doing to me here? Um, so all those are packed together. Yeah, Paris. I hope that's the question. Um, in in all in those three eyes there, where would it fall in line where? The actual leader has to have some type of skill set to actually do the work of the people who he's. Because I've been in the competence side of things. Yeah, like he actually knows how to do the work of the person <laughs> below him. Uh, where, where in there? Okay, I'm going to defend guys that don't have competence for a second. Okay. And then I will come. Uh, the short answer is it's this idealized influence. Okay. It's the idea that that the role model, and you see this particularly in. Um, military and political context, where especially in the military, uh, you can't be a military leader unless you have demonstrated competence at a lower level of leadership. Yeah. People just won't, you know, like, I'm not jumping out of this hole into people that want bad things for me unless I know that you have jumped out of a hole previously and done it well, yeah. right? So uh, that's the military context. But yeah, the, okay, so how do you follow an incompetent leader? Um, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, no, but there is now, there is, in, at least in a theoretical environment, does a leader have to know how to do all the things at the various levels of the organization? Meaning, if you are the CEO of Ford, do you have to be a car guy? Like, do you have to be able to fix cars? Because if you can't, you can't relate to like two-thirds of your workforce. If you can't fix cars or design cars, the only guys left to relate to are the sales guys, and nobody cares about those guys. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so, but that's an honest question. If you are the CEO of Southwest Airlines, do you have to be able to fly planes or work on planes? What do you think? No. This goes directly to competence, though. <clears throat> Why not? Depending on the level of leadership and who you manage, but a CEO, it's, he's, he's doing something totally different with the, with the organization. He's, he's driving the organization to achieve goals that are not specific to mechanics or uh, flying a plane or anything like that. It, it's just, it's an overall environment and, 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 and vision that he's putting, to, and what he needs to know is how to do that. Yeah, and, and now there's an interesting, because if you're a ground level employee and you hear that, you might, be tempted to think, I just heard a whole lot of buzzwords that cover for the fact that this guy doesn't know what I do. Right. Now, that's worst case scenario. The, the best case scenario is you'll hear people saying, look, I, I can't fix cars, but I understand the car market. Right. Like, I understand what moves cars. Right. Um, I understand what people are looking for when they need cars. I understand what's coming down the road as far as the next kind of cars. And so at that point, on one level, you are eminently competent. And at another level, like you're a disaster, right? So if it ever happens where, uh, you know, and you see this sometimes in, in environments where the, the workforce goes on strike and the managers don't, and you can tell certain companies freak out more than others when that happens because they're like, oh my gosh, none of our managers know how to do anything as far as like turning dials and making sure that, you know, things are produced. Like, we've got to settle with the union fast. And then you have other companies who are like, oh, okay, we, we, we can manage for a while and we'll let you know, this strike exist. You can tell the company and how they treat management and leadership development and where their leaders come from, typically. 
But at the C-suite level, right, the CEO, the CFO, that kind of thing, competence is typically measured differently, right, by necessity. Um, and in, in some cases, now you do have, obviously you have some companies where a guy started, you know, on the production line and now he's running the thing. Um, and that was good because now he really does understand every level of the organization. Like I said, the military, you can't get to be a four-star general unless you were at one time a second lieutenant. Um, and some of those guys were NCOs before that. So, so there are some organizations that are built to kind of isolate judgments of competence. Mm -hmm. And then there are other organizations where, no, you got to know how the thing works. Um, and so one of, I think one of the tricks to leadership is when, you, when leaders set themselves up as role models, the basis by which they do that speaks a lot to their character, right? Because if you have, if you have a guy who takes over, well, actually, this was asked, uh, any of you attend the Global Leadership Summit from Willow Creek? So the CEO of Ford uh, gave his kind of story, and in that, they said, um, but you don't know anything about cars. Like, you were running Boeing before you came over to Ford. And he said, you're right, I don't know anything about cars. I do know a little something about making a machine that has like whatever he said, 40 million moving parts and ours fly. And so they were like, good point, okay, so you can probably cover something that stays on the ground. All right, good. Um, and I thought that was brilliant because he wasn't, he wasn't arrogant when he said that. He was just saying, I know it's not an apples to apples thing, but it's not as far removed as you might think. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. So did that kind of yeah. address that a little bit? So we have, so any other thoughts on, on the four eyes here? I can see where the intellectual stimulation is threatening in the nonprofit sector. Why? Why is it threatening in the nonprofit? We've never done it that way. It's, <laughs> it's something that comes out of church members' mouths. Sure. It's what comes out of volunteers' mouths. And yet, unless we challenge, there is no change for the better. Yeah, and and that's tricky, right? In nonprofits and in in most religious organizations, whether they're parachurch or church, uh, that we've never done it this way creeps up. Now that creeps up in secular organizations too. Right. Um, where it's different in nonprofit and religious work is you have a real emotional connection mm -hmm. to how we used to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I use this when I consult with churches. I say churches rarely have bad ideas. Churches typically have good ideas, maybe not always great ideas. And they usually have good ideas because at one time it was a great idea. But you have a whole emotional component that's built in. And I usually try and use some like crazy wild example because you never know what you're going to trip on when you consult churches. And so I'll tell them, you know, at, you know, if your church had a ministry to drop flyers from a plane, you would only do that because somebody's grandson or granddaughter came to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior because a flyer hit them from the sky. And churches will find a way to justify renting a plane and dropping leaflets for the next 30 years because so-and-so had a grandson or granddaughter that came to know Jesus that way. It, it, that could be a marginally good idea. It's probably not a wildly fantastic idea. But that's where the emotional baggage comes in, right? Mm -hmm. and, and nonprofits, too. This nonprofit was started to accomplish A, B, C, and D in a context that looks like this. Well, assuming A, B, C, and D all still need to be done and the context hasn't changed, then you're probably still golden. But if one of those, one of those things has changed, now you've got to rethink what you're doing. Or you're engaging a client base or ministering to a context that literally doesn't exist anymore. And so, so change-happy leaders, right, the ones that are totally fine with change, good with conflict, they'll come in and burn the house down because they want to rebuild it. People who are anti-change and not good with conflict will run and hide behind the, well, we've never done it that way before, and they'll start wringing their hands and like, well, um, we'll talk about that at next year's retreat, you know, that kind of stuff. And then 30 years goes by and nothing changes. So the really, really good leaders are the ones that probably strike a balance that, that understand the emotional components, but also understand the changing clients or context. Um, so yeah, you can you can definitely see how that would, would rear its ugly head. Anything else about these, these four eyes? 
So, so Bass comes along and says, okay, well, this is how it works. We have transactional leadership, which we're not throwing out. Right? We're not doing the way, because contingent reward is still alive and well. you still got to pay people. And you still got to demonstrate some sort of, give them the ability to demonstrate some sort of worth there. But what we're going to do is we're going to add some other things on top of it, and that's where this transformational leadership concept comes in. And so, so on top of contingent reward and management by exception, now we're also adding those four I's. And now we are seeing organizations that are performing above their expected outcomes. So if they want more out of the machine, these guys come along and they say, this is how you get more out of the machine. And the model for transformational leadership looks like this. And it's called the full range of leadership model. It's been refined and refined and refined and refined. Look, boxes and arrows, did I tell you? Um, I skipped the slide with a lot of lists. But you know, there you go. And so what you see here is you see a couple of continuums. How many of you have ever worked for a laissez-faire leader? Yeah. <laughs> and immediately the cringes happen. Oh, yeah, I remember that. It was painful. Um, I, I've worked for, for laissez-faire leaders. And these are guys who say, I don't want to mess with people. You know, I don't want to be a dictator. So I'm going to be hands off. And I'm going to see how it goes. Now, if they are really hands off, okay, really, really removed, Leadership scholars call those guys non-leaders. If they, if they are wanting to be hands-off, and then they engage when the wheels start to come off, then now we are into management by exception. Usually passive at that point. And so you can see the frequency of activity and engagement moving from the bottom left-hand quadrant, which is non-leadership, all the way up to either the three eyes, four eyes, or five eyes, depending on which list of eyes you want to go with, which is transformational leadership and the range of leadership in between there. Now, the reason that it is described on a continuum like this is because there are environments where, not laissez-faire necessarily, but where management by exception is needed. Give me one. When you have to be a management by exception leader. <laughs> Parenting. Yes. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. We are firmly in management by exception. <laughs> which is, I take exception to a lot of things that they do. That's, that's what that is. Hopefully this video is destroyed by the time they start watching it. Um, yeah, but, but this is parenting, right? Especially if you have more than one child, right? Please give that back to them. That is management by exception. Please don't take that from them, you know, and stop doing this. That's management by exception. It has to happen. Now, take it out of the parenting world, which those jokes write themselves, and think of it in a different kind of industrial setting or organizational setting. When do you have to manage by exception? When VP's oil plant blows up and all of a sudden you hear from the CEO who you haven't heard from in 10 years. And <laughs> okay, you want to go right to the natural disaster. Okay, yeah, fine, yeah, sure. Talk, yeah. um, when someone's in danger. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So you'll see this in a disaster setting, but you'll see this especially in, um, okay, go to med school and try and imagine getting out of med school without any management by exception. Because in med school, you'll hear stuff like, don't cut the chicken there. <laughs> that would go badly if that was a person, you know? <laughs> Um, so, so management by exception isn't inherently a bad thing. Now, the hovering and smacking your employees, that, that's bad, okay? I got that on video, bad. Um, now, but there are environments where management by exception is called for because transformational leadership isn't at all corrective. It is aspirational, right? So can you imagine, go back to the medical environment and go, hey, next time, Let's try not to kill our patient. I mean, I don't know, just thinking, you know, because we value life and, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we value health and took that whole Hippocratic Oath thing and we take that seriously around here. So next time, let's try not to, you know, let's aspire to do better. You know, it's not going to go like that, right? Uh, it's going to go next time. Really, we value life. Let's try and keep everybody alive. 
Um, and so you see that aspect. Now, and, and we've already talked about it, can you throw out contingent reward completely? No. No. Okay, no. Now put this in a volunteer type lens. Do volunteers work with contingent reward systems? Why? Help. That's, that's on the back information. That's their bag. Yeah. Yeah. Which if you're a volunteer and you're looking for more than pads on the bag, you're going to be disappointed, right? But. A condition. Do what? Yeah. I mean, but. Fuel for their passion. Yeah, that's right. People who motivate and use volunteers well are tapping into a contingent reward system, in a sense, that has no tangible rewards. In the form of money and recognition, or money and I meant formal recognition. But you're very much going to, hey, I know that you value this, so come join us as we accomplish that, you know, or play an integral role in how this takes place, whether it's feeding people or literacy or stopping human trafficking or whatever it is, you know, there's no money in it here for you, but. Sign up because this is the cause. And so you have, you have a weird melding of transformational properties there and contingent reward. It's just the reward doesn't have any stock price attached to it. But it's still very much a reward. And, and I see leaders, typically young leaders, but I see leaders of all ages that think, well, I'm going to be transformational even if they don't have the language for it. And so I don't need to worry about that whole contingent reward thing. At that point, you are trading on the best intentions of people without ever reinforcing why they got involved in the first place. And that's a very dangerous road to go down. It's, it's the road to short-term effectiveness, basically. There's no long-term benefit in there. So even managing volunteers, which, you know, managing volunteers is probably one of the trickiest things out there in the leadership circles. Because you, don't, you can't result to the tangible reward system. Right? You can't just say, well, let's talk about your hours. Let's talk about your pay. Let's talk about your benefits. Let's talk about a bonus structure. There's no bonus structure for volunteers. Uh, so all, so you know, most of this has a role in how leadership gets played out on a day-to-day -day level. Right? Now, when you think of transformational leaders, let's say public leaders, who are the ones that you think of? Can you think of any? In terms of public leaders? Yeah. The well mayor. known, huh? The mayor. Okay. Yeah, well known personalities. Who who do you think has walked out? Like, who do you think the leadership scholars run to when they say, oh, like Can this? Can go back a long way? Absolutely. You can go back and forth. Like the uh, Coca. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll say Martin Luther King. Yeah, Martin Luther King. Yeah. Who else? Lincoln. Lincoln? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because think about it, the idealized influence, right? We'll, we'll put the list up here again. Idealized influence, intellectual stimulation. Did Lincoln check the intellectual stimulation box? Yeah, the whole emancipation thing. <laughs> uh, that was challenging at the time. That was challenging paradigms at the time. The willing to let the nation go to war over ideals was a paradigm challenging thing. Um, people were saying, we've always done it this way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you want to talk about, we've always done it this way. Yeah, uh, that's true. I would, I would not have thought about that, but that's totally true. Um, yeah, now, and, and Lincoln actually is, is famous for his individualized consideration, for being a president who was really, really good at one-on-one -on -one personal relationships when, you know, the the cameras are turned off, they were all turned off then. But, you know, the how does he handle people? How does he relate to people, even people who don't like him? Um, in fact, he, he was criticized a little bit because he wasn't quicker to fire people, specifically generals. Um, but, you know, he knew those guys. He talked to them. He visited the camps. And so, um, so Lincoln checks a lot of these boxes. Anybody else that you think of? William Wallace. Interesting. William Wallace, okay rounds up a um, bunch of guys who talk about the way we've always done it never thought to to throw off the crown um, 
absolutely had to be out front leading, literally out front, because uh, you can't do that kind of fighting from behind. Um, recently I saw something on PBS, and we don't normally think of this person as this magnificent leader, but George Herbert Walker Bush and his individualized consideration was, that was his priority job. Mm -hmm. He wrote more thank you notes than anybody could ever, you know, calculate. Sure. Because he, he dealt with that part. Yeah. Yeah, and actually Lincoln, uh, Lincoln is more famous for the letters he didn't send mm -hmm. than the ones that he did. Because one of Lincoln's things was he needed to write to get clarity, and so he would get a bad report from from a general or something, and he would write a scathing letter like, you know, get moving, do da 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 da, and then he'd sit on it, and he'd go to sleep, or he'd walk away for a few hours and come back, and a lot of those letters, the majority of them, never got sent to the recipients because he 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 needed a moment to vent, but he also remembered, you know, I'm going to go back to my values. Yeah. Steve Jobs is one that comes to mind of hitting all those really hard. Yeah, and Steve Jobs, so last month we talked about charismatic and narcissistic leadership and the fine line between them in some context. Um, and so when the video is out in another week or so, you'll, you'll want to watch that because um, Steve Jobs did three of these <coughs> and was terrible at individualized consideration. Um, and that, I didn't know Steve Jobs, but by all accounts of people who did, you know, he was the one who would thrash employees in meetings and was very brash and abrasive. Now, did he, was he a role model in some respects? Absolutely. I, I'm sure sales of black turtlenecks went up. I mean, people wanted to be him, you know? Yeah, but which time around, though? Which time around? His first time or second time? Yeah, if you read the first time, I would probably agree with you that individualized consideration was bad, which is partly what got him out of there. But the second time around, I, I, the, I, I only have a couple of sources. Story. The Isaacson uh, biography yeah, on him okay. is excellent okay. um, and was the source material for one of the movies that came out. Uh, read the Isaacson biography of Jobs. It was just fascinating, too, because to work for a highly creative guy who wasn't all that good on people skills most to most people. He had an inner circle. Um, but for most people, they, they tolerated working for him because he got other things done. Um, and, but, but I think that's a good reminder of, we're talking about thin lines here, right? right. Um, so the people that I thought of, um, in addition to who you had thought of, um, Gandhi is always listed. In, in the list of being a transformational leader and taking people and saying, this is what we aspire to. These are the idealized goals that we're going after. These are the values that we have to walk out. And this is how we walk it out. Um, Martin Luther King, obviously, Lincoln is on there. Uh, Colette from Southwest Airlines is on there. And also, I, I put, um, well, Nelson Mandela uh, is, is regarded as a, as a hugely transformational leader, and not just within South African politics, but worldwide. You know, this is, these are the values, these are the goals, this is how you be a role model, this is how we walk out our values, this is how we demonstrate individualized concern. Um, and then uh, Billy Graham, I, I put on there also, um, mostly because if you talk to people who know him, um, they say, camera on, camera off, he's the same guy. Um, he really was a guy, most of his life, who wanted to sit on a rocking chair and talk and pray and discern and, you know, I mean, talk about an ability to move masses of people to embrace higher aspirations. Um, that's all there. Now, the leadership debate that always happens is this guy. So was Hitler a transformational leader? Yeah, but the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the wrong way. Yeah, he was. Yeah, now, so Burns and Bass in particular would say to be a transformational leader, you have to be morally uplifting. So the right way, right? Yeah. So when it comes to leaders like Hitler and others who are able to take masses of people and get them to achieve goals and do that through a network of relationships and casting a compelling vision, like Hitler was fantastic at casting vision. It's just the vision was abhorrent, right? But it wasn't that he didn't, he wasn't able to convince people. 
He was able to whip an entire country into a frenzy. And so what they came up with was a tag for guys to do this, and the tag is pseudo-transformational. Which means all the hallmarks of transformation are there, but, but it went the wrong way, like to use Paris' example. Uh, and so we're going to call those guys pseudo-transformational. Um, so there is, you know, there is that in, in leadership. Now, and again, this, it can be subtle. The differences between transformational, what, what they would call authentic transformational, and pseudo-transformational can sometimes be very subtle. Because we're still talking about taking groups of people and getting them to rally around a cause and marshal their own resources. And in some cases, he's even catering to and appealing to the needs and the values of those people. Right? It's the gang leadership process, too. Because, because pseudo-transformational leaders do lead by fear in a lot of cases. But also, as we look back through history and we look at some transformational leaders, or pseudo-transformational leaders, they're pulling out needs and prejudices and opinions of people and saying, yes, that little completely amoral thought that you had right there um, isn't really good for humanity, but let's, let's talk about that, right? And let's pull that out. And maybe it's not as bad as everybody thought. Maybe you should think like that. Maybe you should do something about that. They validate those things. Absolutely. And then by that time, you have a bunch of people going, yeah, I feel like that too. I do too. Let's... Yeah. You're not the only one. Right. And then it goes bad on mass scales. And so you have this idea of, of pseudo-transformation. Um, transformation, I told you there's going to be a list. Um, authentic transformation typically comes from a base of virtue. Okay, so as we talk about this idea of moral leadership. Now, morals can be debated as far as, you know, what is uplifting, what's not. Um, there's, there's a little bit of gray area there, but basically the literature runs to this list of six virtues and then 24 characteristics, because remember, arrows, boxes, and lists, um, of, how, of character traits that display a certain underlying virtue. And so those virtues, wisdom and knowledge, and this goes to um, a little bit of what Paris was talking about earlier as far as competence. It's, it's very rare that you can have a successful leader, in fact, I, I'm racking my brain to try and think of one, of a leader who really didn't know what they were doing, didn't have the ability to process what they were doing. Now, you can think of all kinds of dumpster fire leaders that it was just a train wreck from the beginning, but as far as leaders that accomplished something, they would bring some amount of wisdom with them, um, some amount of knowledge with them, and it may be knowledge that they're transferring in. It may be that they have a teachable spirit and they can be developed, whatever it is. But there's an aspect of, of wisdom there. And so some of the character traits that you see there is um, leaders that love to learn. There's something about being around a leader who loves to learn that is refreshing. Because for one thing, um, if you love learning, you're not a raging narcissist because narcissists think you already, they already know it all. Um, and so if you're around someone who loves leading, it also um, gives people permission to think there may be something else out there that we need to know or need to better understand. Or maybe I'm not thinking about this well. Or maybe other people are thinking about this differently and I need to, to uh, leverage that. So there's something there. Um, transformational leaders have to be courageous. Now why do they have to be courageous? Challenges. Uh, you mean like they have yeah, to embrace it? I mean, yeah. Uh, leadership uh, by, by its nature is, is counter. Uh, that's interesting. Le so leadership by its nature involves conflict. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot of people that would agree with that statement. Um, the reason that that makes me uncomfortable is because I see guys that like conflict oh, I know, I know. and get into leadership. <laughs> um, as opposed to leaders who understand in order to achieve goals and visions and to move people and to aspire to different things, there are going to be bumps along the road. Yeah, there's a certain think, level of conflict that you're going to encounter. Absolutely. It's not, it's not looking for it, but yeah. the, the, anytime you want to transform something, you have to get with uh, uh, attitudes like we've done it before, and that presents a challenge. Yeah. And you, you need to have courage to, to face it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's the standing up to the conflict, not necessarily hitting at the conflict, but standing up to the conflict and allowing them to 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 oppose your view or whatever and not be knocked under yeah. by their opposition. I was going to say, and that, that brings out a really good leadership principle there of how do you how do you dwell in the midst of conflict? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you how do you let tension exist? Um, because you'll see a lot of guys that they equate leadership with putting out fires immediately. So as soon as one pops up, they tamp it down. And what they think that's leadership, what they're doing is they're being anti-conflict. Right. And so they're like, oh, we can't, no, 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 not that, no, not that over here. And that becomes their life, right? Instead of saying, every once in a while, that's got to burn for a little bit. You know, people got to get around this line of thinking. Um, so yeah, and it takes a certain, you know, fortitude in order to do that. And also, you have, you know, leaders are typically out front, right? The whole buck stops here thing. Um, Alexander the Great used to, uh, he told his men purportedly one time, there's no part of my body, in the front at least, that hasn't been pierced by a sword or an arrow. <laughs> and what he's saying is, if someone's going to get shot around here, it's going to be me first. So let's go. Now, He's leading in a particular context where that was a good thing. But, uh, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? That's not a rally cry at churches. You know, like, uh, no. Um, so then there's this, this virtue of humanity. Um, if, if you don't have the humanity virtue in transformational leadership, what does that look like? Narcissist. It, can, it definitely can look narcissistic, for sure. Assuming it's not blatantly narcissistic, yeah. it can look like other stuff too. If you if you miss the humanity thing, what could it look like? Laissez faire. Could look like laissez faire. You can do a bunch of transformational things, not be laissez faire, and also not have the humanity component. So if you're engaging, so it's not laissez faire, but you still don't have that humanity component, what does it look like? It looks manipulative. Is, is what it looks like. It looks like you're working a machine. The machine just happens to be built of people. That's the right one. Yeah, and so, I mean, you know, narcissists will do this intuitively, like that's part of a narcissistic worldview. But, but even, the, you know, even people with different personality types, if you're heavily goal-oriented and not a heavily relational person, it may not be out of a narcissistic tendency that you are using people but you are thinking, this is what we got to do. So I'm going to appeal to this person along this level, and I'm going to position the, the organization like this, and we are going to do this. And at the end of the day, you cross the finish line, right? But behind you is a bunch of people going, ah, I can't, okay, I can't go any further. You know, I mean, at that point, you miss the the humanity aspect of things. Um, and and this is extremely possible in in transformational environments because you have guys with the best of intentions right we're gonna we're gonna take that hill we're gonna go we're gonna do this and it's gonna be great or you know especially if you're cause oriented you know we're gonna stop human trafficking in Houston we're gonna do that and ironically you could lead an effort to stop human traffic trafficking and run over bodies in the process mm -hmm. that make sense that's that, very uh, easy yeah the, the description of it, lack of humanity reminds me of a phrase called what have you done for me lately? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and kind of sounds heartless. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and when it's rampant, it looks heartless. I mean, it feels heartless. You can also I, I've seen leaders who are basically good leaders who have no emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. which means they don't understand how their emotions are affecting their own leadership and they don't understand how their emotions are affecting other people. And so they can be goal oriented, they can do all those other things, but they will just shoot from the hip occasionally and hit somebody, you know? And people are like, man, I, this leader does so many great things and I really believe in the vision and I believe in the goals and gosh, I just wish that sometimes you wouldn't say that or I wish she would sometimes think about this and instead of that, you know? Leaders Sometimes who don't, don't understand the power of insult. Well, sure, or compliment, right. right? I mean, both of those are equally pointed to stop the direction. Um, and so when you have people who are really good, well-intentioned, smart, intelligent people who don't have social or emotional intelligence, you can see this come about too. And 
and I should stick up for people who this happens to without them being like a raging manipulator or a raging narcissist. I mean, this is an easy trap. Not everybody has high levels of, of emotional intelligence. Um, and so you'll see people who inherently treat people a little bit different. Um, this is, you know, just a little confession time. Uh, this is something that I wish I do better. It's something, actually, I'm a really highly emotionally intelligent person five minutes after I should have been. <laughs> because I'll be driving away going, man, I didn't ask about, you know, the, the, you know, like, the wife and the baby and the whatever, and I'm like, oh, and I feel really bad. So it's not that I have no emotional intelligence, I have no emotional timing. Uh, so, but anyway, that, that happens, and so I'm sticking up for us, I mean them, the people. So there's, there's three other virtues, let's move quickly to those. Um, there's this sense of justice when you are a transformational leader. Now, how does that play out? Why is there a virtue of justice in men and women who are transformed, transformational leaders? A sense of justice. Where does that come from? I think it comes from the sense of humanity, maybe. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's tied to the other one, for sure. But flesh that out. Tied to a sense of humanity. They see, they see everybody equal. It's, it's, it's that we all part of the same humanity here and, and they don't see differences. Yeah, and they, so, the, so maybe one of the key distinctions between humanity and justice is people who have a really demonstrated value of justice see things in the world that shouldn't be that way and it bothers them, mm -hmm. right? Even if it's not necessarily focused on a particular person, but these are people who go, you know, it just, I don't know what it is, but that's wrong, or that shouldn't be happening that way, or this group is disenfranchised, or this is an injustice. There's something that bothers them. And you see this fleshed out, and, and here you see it fleshed out, citizenship, fairness, leadership. The whole concept of leadership is that change is necessary, because the current condition is insufficient, right? That is leadership. Yeah. Josh, I think that, that justice would even add to your followers. Yeah. Would add to your followers. Yeah, me. because the sense of justice would allow oh, more well. people to join in to that that organization or that cause. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I used to tell my kids this all the time, not that they listened to it, <laughs> but it didn't work better in the, in the corporate world, and I said, you will not be treated equally, but you will be treated fairly. Uh -huh. And so the sense of justice is that when you think about larger organizations, you know, there is there's a sense of equality amongst different ranks of people. And I think the virtue would be able to keep those ranks separate, a clerk from a supervisor, from a manager, from a vice president, or whatever. But people understand that I'm not going to be treated equally, but I am going to be treated fairly. And, yeah, and, and to add to that, I will be treated well, right? right that's, and right. the to go one step further, even if it's not different levels on the org chart, this the whole idea of individualized consideration, in addition to kind of the shepherding side of things, is understanding the differences in people. Which means if I'm a leader and I have a major extrovert and a major introvert, I'm not going to treat these people the same. Because there is something fundamentally different at their core that if I treated them the same, I would be doing one of them a blatant disservice. I might be doing both of them a blatant disservice. Um, and so, it, you know, it's this idea that in order to be treated well, and in order for justice to exist, there are things that should be done a certain way. That's kind of where this virtue of justice comes from. Um, it, it flows right into temperance. Um, you see this um, a lot in transformational leaders as far as um, not only how they regulate their own emotions, but even at a deeper level, um, is this a is this person a raging narcissist that's trying to put on a good face, or is this someone who really approaches leadership with some degree of humility? Um, and remember, I said when I was talking about narcissism, everybody has at least some degree of narcissism, or you wouldn't consider life worth living. But are you approaching your leadership task with modesty and humility and a sense of duty um, rather than a sense of entitlement? 
Um, that is kind of what is seen in this idea of temperance. How well do you uh, forgive? How well do you tolerate mistakes? Um, you see some leaders, I think it was, um, I think it was Truman who said, uh, whenever I make a big mistake, I rush out as soon as I can and make another one. And his, his thinking was, I learn from my mistakes, and I know they're going to happen. And pretending otherwise is just naive. And so, you know, make a mistake, learn from it, move on. Um, uh, I can't remember what Warren Buffett says about this when he says, um, when a mistake is found or something like that, uh, get it right, get it out, and something. And there's a third one, which basically says, get on, maybe it's get on with it. Um, and so it's this idea that um, you see this not displayed at all in, in dictatorships, right? Because mistakes are met with capital punishment. Um, so leaders who are saying, I, I will acknowledge some level of, now, you're not supposed to do that in other environments, but um, you know, you still see the, the underlying value there um, of temperance. And I, I skipped the last one there, which is not on that slide. Um, oh, it's transcendence. It's this idea, again, of leadership that um, we're all striving for something more however you define what more is. And um, it's also this ability to appreciate um, excellence. And I got to explain this to my five-year-old while watching football this weekend. We were watching a, uh, a game that I didn't particularly care about, and he had asked me before who we, who we were rooting for. And we're watching this, and, and a guy just made a fantastic catch for the other team. And my five-year-old and I are sitting there, and I said, man, that was a great catch. Watch this catch, Gavin. And he watched it and he's like, that's a good catch. And he's like, but that, that person's on the other team. Yeah. And there was a real disconnect there. He's like, aren't we supposed to wish bad things on them? And I was like, only the Raiders, kid. We only root bad things for the Raiders. <laughs> um, lifelong Bronco fan, whatever. So, uh, but, you know, I am raising my child that way. Don't judge me. So, but this idea of, you know, when you, when you, when you have the core value of transcendence, you have the ability to appreciate what is done well. Even if it's not something that you can do, even if it's not something that necessarily went your way, man, that was a really good catch. Or, um, you know, I started out as a, as a pre-law major in college, and so we would talk about different things, and, and I would be able to say to people, and that was a really good argument. I mean, I got, I got trounced, <laughs> but that was a really well done argument. Um, it's kind of this ability to say, okay, there's something more that we should be shooting for. Um, just very quickly, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time about this. There are strengths and weaknesses to transformational leadership. One of the weaknesses of this model is that it tends not to be easy to define. It tends to be something that people recognize in hindsight and very hard to walk out intentionally. Um, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. We're going to come back to that. It also... Uh, the other weakness is it tends to be easy to confuse transformational leadership with a form of trait leadership. Because you start looking at idealized influence, you start looking at, at intellectual stimulation and guys with charisma or gals with charisma and you go, I'm not that. I don't have that level of charisma or I, you know, I'm emotionally slow, not emotionally unintelligent, whatever it is. Uh, you know, uh, those people are just better than I am. And as soon as you cross that bridge, and you're not assuming that they're better because they have developed and worked at being better, then now you are drawing a trait distinction between you and them. Uh, and this happens in the, in the literature all the time. Scholars are like, eh, I don't really know how to mess with that. Steve Jobs was inherently more visionary than just about anybody else in his life, or our life. Uh, now, there are a whole other things, you know, a whole bunch of other things going on there. But, um, and it's okay to be naturally predisposed in different ways, right? We're all created differently. Um, but if you assume that transformational leadership is trait leadership, it gives you permission not to do it, right? right? You're like, well, I don't have to be intellectually stimulating anybody because only the trait leader people do that, and I don't do that. Um, there also is, with the pseudo-transformation aspect, there's a potential for abuse. Right? Very easy to, to say the right things, get people to do the right things, blah, 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 and get the results that you want and not really care about those people. You would be pseudo-transformational if you asked Burns or Bass or anybody else, but very easy to do that. Now, 
let's talk about this other weakness. There is an appearance sometimes in transformational leaders um, of elitism. And the charge of elitism comes against transformational leadership because of this question. Where does the vision come from? So let's talk about that. Where does the vision in an organization come from? <laughs> Pastor Marte would like to say God, and he would like to say it in a three-syllable way, because that's how you really say it if you mean it. Um, we all know those people who do that, so I'll edit that out of the video later. Um, I have friends who do that. Um, where does the vision come from? Assuming it is not sent to you in an email from heaven.com. Um, so if you get that email, share with the rest of us. I would like that address. Um, but seriously, where does that vision come from? And actually, let's pull at that thread a little bit because my industry is churches. And so I deal with a lot of leaders who say, I have a vision from God, right? Now, how do you deal with that as a follower? What are the implications there? This is a safe place. Yeah. We'll edit all this out if you want to. You can argue it because it comes from God. Right, right. So immediately you're kind of putting the, okay. do, is this really what I want to spend my tips on? What if it actually is from God? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it brings conversation to a halt, mm -hmm. for one thing. Now, now, there are several pastors in the room. Defend yourselves <laughs> because... Sometimes the vision does come from God. A lot of times I hope it comes from, from God. Is there a way to do that and still have people buy into the process? As a person sitting listening to a, a visionary person, my criticism or my, my critical looking at that is going to be, does it align with Scripture? Sure. If you, yeah, and if you have, in a church setting, that's an easy lens to wash it through, right? I mean, seemingly easy, because at least you have um, an objective batch of source material. To and go I'm not going to listen to them unless they can connect it to Scripture. Sure. Now, what if, so take it out of a church environment. What if I'm really good at manipulating the Scripture? Well, well, and you don't even have to be good at manipulating the Scripture. What if you're good at appealing to values, mm -hmm. right? And so, I mean, this is easy to chase it in a dark direction. So let's keep it over here a little more in the light. If you have, I mean, you have a really visionary leader, okay? So remove church out of it for just a second as far as a God-given vision. You have somebody that you are following a visionary leader. Is it entirely dependent on the leader to give that vision? Go ahead. I'm going to throw a wrench in this. Okay, do it. God gave leader a mandate, a vision. Mm -hmm. God sends people into that body, assembly, ministry, whatever. Okay. He's also given each one of them a calling, a vision, a mandate. Sure. Part of that is going to be the same hopefully, if you're coming on board with something, that same mandate and vision that the leader has, but there's going to be things that God gave us individual people as well. So if they come on full board fully, then the vision changes. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So churches are, this is how churches start doing everything, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's how organizations start doing everything. Right? So take church completely out of it. You have a CEO who's driving toward three goals. And they hire a CFO, a COO, or whatever, who brings two more goals. Um, entire books, entire careers have been made by people who say the organizations that stay true to their goals, ruthlessly true, are the ones that succeed. The ones that start doing, oh, yeah, we can also do that. The ones that we can also do that. Or, yeah, that fits in. Or we could slide that under one of our other goals. All of a sudden, then, you have this kind of organizational creep, right? And now you start doing a little bit of everything. Um, not a person organizational creep. That's a different thing. Um, but now, again, some of you senior leaders in here are, are visionary leaders, because I know you. If you stand up, in front of an organization, any organization, 
is it totally on the leader in a transformational environment to have that vision? Not totally. Why not? So that's a tough question to answer, right? Because there's so many variables. Sure. Right? So I, as I think through elements of that, you know, I think elements of parts of the vision come from the environment. Parts of the vision come from the collective capabilities of the people that are focusing on something in that environment. Um, and it's kind of a, it's, 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 it's a process, I think, of matching up the, the needs of an environment with the collective capacity of the people that want to address the needs of the environment. If I can work my way through this a little bit, I mean, the, the, um, the environment establishes the need. I would say, right? And that's in the business world, that's in the ministry world, right? I mean, I look at my ministry now, I'm in, I'm in place because there's, I'm in the ministry because there's a need for people to come come into a relationship with God, right? Sure. In, in, a, in a corporate setting, I'm in business because there's a need that somebody recognized needed to be fulfilled. Okay, and then I match that up with, okay, what resources, what people do I have around me to address that need and, do we, and, and so we determine as a collective whole what we think that need is and do we have the capacity to solve that need or another need or whatever need and you match that with the, the capacity, the passions um, and all of a sudden you're starting to find, hey, there's, there's something out there that we together can accomplish. Yeah, yeah. The, the concept of shared vision, mm -hmm. wow. It, it's, it comes to play here, but there's always have to be someone driving that yeah. shared vision. Yeah, yeah, so where does the buck stop even right. in a shared vision environment? You know, I think yeah. uh, a lot of times the leader, leader's job is, could be as simple as pointing out the obvious of what everybody else sees, you know. Mm -hmm. sure. I mean, what he was saying about environment, everybody knows the environment, everybody knows what's happening, but somebody has to say, look, this is happening. And unless we do this, this, and this, we can't be where we want to be yeah. in the future. So it's a it's a look at the past, the present, and, and the future. Yeah, in some cases, it's, it's really putting words to what everybody already acknowledges. Right. And in other cases, it is people are swimming in their world so much that they actually don't see what's going on outside the fishbowl kind of thing. And so sometimes it takes a leader to say, have you, have you actually seen seen this? Mm -hmm. We do this in sociology all the time where we say, drive through your neighborhood and make note of all the signs that you see. Mm -hmm. And it's really informative because a lot of people, like, I didn't realize that, you know, like, and we ask specifically in people group research, we say, make a note of signs that are in different languages. And say, I didn't, or, or names that have a different, you know, ethnic or ancestral background than you do. And I'll say, man, I didn't realize I had, at a dentist from this background, or you know, this street sign is, or this business sign is actually in Arabic or in Chinese or whatever it is, and people are like, man, I drive past this all the time. Why didn't I see this? It's because you drive past it all the time. Is there a stop sign? Yeah, yeah, I've never yeah. stopped there. There's a stop sign there. <laughs> really thought that was a triangular. Yeah, I thought that was a yield sign. I could have sworn. Um, <laughs> yeah, and and this really is a tricky question because a lot of leaders, once they get to a leadership position, a vision casting position, they will see this and go, okay, not only do I have to have a vision, I have to own a vision, and I have to guard the vision, because if somebody comes at that vision, then they will be coming at me. And if you've never worked in an environment where that comes into play, count yourself lucky, but it really does happen, especially as organizations are say, you are our leader. Please tell us where we're going, right? In one sense, you know, a lot of guys receive that and go, woo, look, all these people are going to do what I want them to do. And then in another sense, you know, that can be really terrifying to say, what if my vision's wrong? Or what if it's incomplete? Or, you know, I'm really kind of more of a collaborative leader and I, I really need a lot of different perspectives and I'm, I'm a consensus builder. And all of that, all that, by the way, can be transformational. And so how do I lead in that environment? Um, and I think you see an uptick, and especially in the last 10 years, but really in the last 15 years, you see a lot of leadership development training that only deals with vision. 
because it's really important to have a clear and compelling vision. What can you do with a clear and compelling vision? What can you get people to do? Direction. Direction, for sure. What else? Change. change. Motivated. Yeah, and you can do anything. You can, you can create change. You can build something from the ground up. You can burn something to the ground. You can do really anything if you have a very clear and compelling vision. Now, it can be clear and not compelling. Mm -hmm. It can be compelling and kind of money. Mm -hmm. But man, you get both of those things right. If you really describe the preferred future well and in a way that relates to people's values and aspirations and what they want also, man, there's not much that can hold you back from that. Because people will kick down doors that are in their way. Um, there is immense power in a clear and compelling vision, and now we're back to pseudo-transformational, right? A clear and compelling vision can cut both ways. And so there's a lot that goes into crafting a really good vision. Um, I, I wanted to, as we're kind of wrapping up, I wanted to give you a recommendation. Um, there are several good books that have been written on this topic. Whether they ever use the words transformational leadership, uh, I, I'm not sure that they do. Maybe these guys do. Um, this is a book called Leadership Challenge by Kuzis and Posner. Um, what they did was they did a bunch of interviews. Uh, it's on your bibliography. Uh, if you want to thumb through one of the older editions, it's out here on the table. If you want to borrow that one, just tell me you're going to borrow it, and, and that would be fine. Um, Leadership Challenge, is. these are two guys who came at this very academically. One of them is a PhD, and they just said, what does it look like in an organizational setting to actually walk out transformational leadership. And so they come up with, um, you can tell these guys are academic, you want to talk about lists. Um, they have five major points and two sub points under each point. Okay, so doesn't look great on a slide, but this is what it is. Um, and what they did was they, they did more than 1,300 interviews with senior leaders in a variety of contexts and try to discern from all of those interviews, and by the way, that's a ton of interviews, try to discern what those positive leadership principles are and how they get fleshed out. And then actually, they developed an inventory that comes along with it called the LPI. Um, and so you can actually take an assessment that rates yourself along these five continuum, or these five factors, and it's a 360 degree assessment, and so you can give it to people that are downline from you and upline from you to help kind of fill in your own assessment according to these strata. So uh, the Leadership Challenge is great. Uh, ben Sinanis' book is also on your bibliography. Those are kind of the two that, um, that my leadership textbooks really lift up as saying, you know, you want to see transformational leadership at work, these are the books that you go to. Uh, Kuzis and Posner, this Leadership Challenge book, um, very easy to digest, and so uh, we're not going to go through the whole bullets there, but I wanted you to at least be aware um, that you don't have to read a leadership textbook or an academic journal article to get more from this. Um, you can read this book, and, and actually, Leadership Challenge is pretty standard um, recommendation in seminaries and business schools and, and that kind of thing, so some of you may have already read it. Um, we got uh, five minutes left. Uh, we've kind of talked about this autocratic temptation that sometimes can happen, but I want to talk about this really quickly. Um, Yukel, who's a guy who writes one of these kind of all leadership theories textbooks that's on your bibliography, he says that the essence of transformational leadership is empowering followers. This is not a quote, this is kind of illusion. And it says, which then may lead to a decrease of attributed charisma and makes the followers less dependent on the leader. So he says, if you're a really good transformational leader, you will develop people, and actually one of the byproducts of developing those people is they will think you to be less charismatic than you are. Is that true, do you think? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. You just say blanket, yes. Mm -hmm. You don't think so, why not? Well, because if people are developing, then it's a given to me that the leader himself is developing and experiencing transformation, and there is a shared vision, so we're going somewhere else, and he's going to be a step or two ahead of them. That's my assumption. And so they're looking to say, wow, we've, we've gathered expertise or ability or capacity in this arena, but now how do we deal with the culture? How do we deal with the changing environment? How do we keep from leaking vision? So to me, if they're creating a whole environment of that, people recognize the importance of 
become a good leader more and more because mm -hmm. they're developing. Yeah, and I would agree with you. Given the assumption that you stated, which is right. that the leader is also developing, right. um, there are organizations out there that have really good employee personal development programs. And people will take advantage of those and learn new skills and develop new stuff, but they notice that the C-suite guys aren't doing any of that. And so eventually that disconnect will happen and they'll go, huh, why? No, now. His whole point is that actually that will diminish the leader's charisma. In that particular instance, it may actually form a judgment of they are not intellectually stimulating anymore. They are not actually buying into this value of personal development because they are not developing, which may actually say, yeah, maybe they think they don't need to develop. And then we're back into the narcissism thing. But um, you said yes. Yeah. I think that once the... Uh once the followers kind of learn all these things, they, they will either step out from that organization and move on, or, or they, you know, they, they just, they'll take over, or they'll, they'll, they'll advance themselves. Interesting. Um, maybe one of these cafes will do generational paradigms in leadership, because you just described a very millennial um, stereotype for, um, personal development, you know, like I will go to a certain organization, I will learn a couple of things, and then I will either, you know, you know, boomers are always afraid that millennials want to run the place as soon as they get there, which isn't really true. Um, but the whole idea of, well, they might leave, because the average career or the average employment stop for a millennial is much shorter than it was for boomers and extras to some degree. So there's this, I'm going to take and run kind of thing. Uh, or it's the, well, now I have developed a little bit and now I'm going to run this place because I have learned, you know, what's good. So I think that can be there. Again, I think that's an indictment on the leader at the top. If, if the leader is so, uh, well, in a takeover scenario, if the leader is so weak that takeovers that easily, then I think you have something. Josh, I think one way that you can measure that is there are a number of illustrations of incredible leaders who attract what I call great leaders under them and around them, that they're developing them, they're growing them to people, and they don't leave because they want to be a part of where this thing is going. Yeah. So I, I was just thinking of a number of, of key leaders in our country and in churches and in organizations. So that's why I don't believe it's true if, again with the assumption that the, it's a shared leadership thing, the culture is going somewhere, but the, these strong leaders, they could lead in any organization, be anywhere, but they want to be with this person because of the, uh, of the connections and the vision. So that's why I don't believe that. that now, I think it definitely but, depends. Okay, okay, go ahead. Depends. I think it depends on the people involved. And I certainly don't think that's a mutually inclusive statement there. Because I think, uh, I mean, to me, and, you know, to me over time, I always wanted to develop more leaders, not just followers. And so I would always want the followers, if you will, less dependent on the leader. But I don't know that that necessarily means that it's going to lead to a decrease of attributed charisma. Yeah, so an empowered workforce is a great thing, right? So I was going to say, an empowered company, you want, I've always wanted more people that felt like they could lead parts of the organization as well, and not just be dependent on the leader, otherwise you're there 20 hours a day. Mm -hmm. The positive spin of this statement going down that road of empowered, lead, uh, of empowered follower and empowered base is, if people start to develop and they start to grow and they start to acquire new skills, it may actually lead to a diminishing of attributed charisma, which is, I need that leader to be out front and doing these things. What they may think is, well, wait a second, I've learned some new skills. I'm actually growing and developing and I have new competencies, but that's not necessarily an indictment of the leadership skills of that guy. It may be a, a, a lessening of that charismatic follower leader dynamic that I need that person to be a certain thing, a certain role model, because I necessarily can't be. Remember, charisma is assumed to be a trait. So. I, think the, I think the other side of that too, though, is, is that um, I don't know what I didn't know. Right. So I didn't know what a charismatic leader was until I, I learned 
what a charismatic leader was and realized, wow, that guy really is charismatic, so it can lead to an increase sure. in oh, yeah. your charisma because now I know what that means. Sure. And I know all these things that he's doing means that that's who he is. Yeah, I mean, the whole, if you're a high capacity leader and you have the ability to retain high capacity leaders, um, that may or may not be an indictment on your charisma. It may say a lot about your competency. Um, it may say a lot about your ability to empower others and give them room to run and develop and build their own capacity, which builds the organization's capacity. And it kind of, it's a positive system that feeds on itself in that regard. Um, so yeah. Doesn't yeah. the relationship changes once you empower a leader? Yeah, so I think it's not, it's, sure. not, it's not dependent so much on the charisma of the leaders. It's, it's a different relationship. No? And it depends on where the relationship started, too. Mm -hmm. um, if you have really dependent followers and they and it changes to empowered followers, it's a different dynamic as, in, in Jeff's case, if you have a high capacity leader and they recruit other high capacity leaders, then maybe not. All right, it is 12.02.